Good morning, everyone. I trust that you've had a good week and that you've enjoyed the series that we've been on this journey over the last few weeks, looking at who this God is that we have the privilege of serving. In the first week, we spoke about how this God is not unknown. We don't have to guess about who he is, but he's made himself known. And there's so much revealed in the scriptures and in the person of Christ that allows us to know what this God is like. We also spoke about some of his unique qualities, things that make him stand out from any other God that's been created by man. This one true God is unique. We spoke about the fact that he is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that have been in relationship with each other for all of eternity. And so this becomes a model for us, created in his image that showed us why we should value community, to be able to live out and express our love and kindness for our fellow believers, for our fellow man in community. And this morning, we want to look at a further aspect of God's nature. As we spoke about community last week and why we value it, this week we want to speak about how to live in community because as we saw last week, it's not always easy. But there's something interesting in the nature of God that helps us to live it out. You see, the Bible tells us about this God and tells us about how much he loves us. But there's something else that's unique about him and that it's not just that our God is loving, it's that our God is love. It's part of his very nature, his fabric, his being, which means he can do nothing other than love. He cannot choose not to love because he is love. That's who he is. And so this morning, I want to read from a, a key passage in one of John's letters that he writes to a community of believers. And John writes to them because, as naturally happens when a community of believers gather, or any community gathers, there's some conflict that has arisen. And John writes to them in a pastoral way, and he speaks into this conflict. He writes to address the conflict and to prevent its spread. And so we're in good company here this morning when we read this letter, because regardless of whether you're facing conflict or not, this tells you how to respond when conflict does arise, which inevitably it does. And so, as always, the scripture, even written this almost 2,000 years before, still has bearing on our lives today. So we read earlier on in the chapter, just before the piece that we're going to read, that one of the reasons why conflict has arisen in the church is that there has been some false teachers. And at this stage, the false teachers have left the church. But John talks about some of the marks of these false teachers that were causing problem. He says one of the things is that these teachers were unloving. In other words, they weren't displaying love. One of the things that they were doing is they were denying the incarnation, which basically means they were denying the fact that Jesus was fully God and fully man. So they were denying the deity of Christ. And the other thing that they were doing is they were claiming not to be sinners. And so this was stirring up all sorts of confusion in the church. And even after they had left the church, the danger was still there that people would follow after their teachings. And so, as I mentioned earlier, even though this happened 2,000 years ago, this still has bearing for us today because we see this all over the world. There are still plenty of false teachers out there, both inside and outside the church. And they still teach these things that can lead many people astray. See, many people still teach that Jesus was just a man or just a prophet, denying the fact that he was the Son of God. There are those who teach that there is no right and wrong, that it's all relative, that it's all up to me. And in doing so, they're teaching that then you are not a sinner. And of course, there are many people who live in a way that doesn't display love. And so we see these same problems that existed in the church before. We still see them today. And so when we read this letter, it's going to make sense to us. Now, in this passage, over and over, we're going to find, and in fact, throughout this whole letter, John hammers on the point about love. Love, love, love comes up over and over. And I thought, as we start talking this morning, let's, before we read that passage, take a moment to define love. Because the biblical view of love has become somewhat distorted in the world today. 
I'm not going to go through all the different Greek words and, and what they mean. Today, I'm just going to simply focus on the definition of love as given to us in the book of 1 Corinthians. And so here, Paul talks about love. He starts off, and we're not going to read this section, but he starts talking about all the things that we can do as believer, the grand believers, the grand and miraculous things that can be done. And he says all of these things are really pointless if they don't come from a place of love. He then goes on to define love, and he ends the section in the letter by saying that no matter what we achieve, if it isn't with love, it was pointless. And so he puts love as the highest goal, the highest good that we can strive towards. And he makes this the focal point within the church. And I'm going to show you why as we read through John's letter and, and other scripture passages this morning. And so love really becomes the focus. And so let's define what love means. In 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, it says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. And so I want to pause here quickly, because as we said last week, for us to be able to live out our faith, it requires that we be in community. Notice how these first sections of love talk about how I'm relating to other people, how I should treat other people, how I should respond to other people with patience, kindness, humility, and honor. These are big asks. And even if I just did these few things that define love, what a different place the world would be. But he goes on. He says, it is not self-seeking. This is a big one. It means that love is not looking out for my own interest. It means I'm putting others above myself above my needs, above my wants, above my desires, I'm coming second to everyone else. Love is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Some translations would say it does not build a case against others. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And again, I want to pause here because this is so important. Love rejoices with the truth. You see, the Bible tells us God is love. Jesus tells us I am the truth. And so both of these things are defined for us. Truth is defined. Love is defined. It's not anything goes. And so often the mistake that we can make in community is by saying in loving people, I'm just going to overlook all things. I'm just going to pretend like everything is acceptable. And of course, that's much of what popular philosophy teaches. Popular worldview today is that everyone is defining things for themselves. Define your own truth. Choose your own truth. Find what's right and wrong for yourself. Define what love means. How love is to be carried out. No, that would be a lie. The Bible has told us what love is and what truth is. And so it's so important that as believers, we realize that it's not always the loving thing to do when we don't stand for truth, when we don't stand for love. Now that means that in a community of believers, there, there might be many disagreements that come up, particularly when reading the scriptures, there's many things that can be unclear. Now, we don't need to divide over every small thing that we come across. Love overlooks those things. We can, we can be in, uh, in dwelling unity, even if we don't agree on every small point. But there are some larger points in scripture that certainly these don't allow any movement. And generally, these things are found kind of in the, the statement of faith of a church. Certainly in our church, this is found in our statement of faith. Key issues that these are things that we, we fight for, that we believe in, that this is truth. And so love rejoices in truth. It's things that we defend, that we believe in, that we stand on. And so important that we know what those things are. And so part of love is protecting the truth. And we're called to do that as a community of believers. Because love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. 
So now that we have this kind of definition of love, we see that it's not a simple thing. It's really, it's really so different to the way the world operates. How incredible would it be if people loved you in this way? And how incredible would it be if you in turn loved in the same way? And so now that we have love in mind, as we've read about it in the scripture, let's read what John writes to the church, to a community of believers in how to live with one another. And so we're going to pick it up in 1 John 4, verse 7 to 21. He says, dear friends, let us love one another. Think of what we've just read. Think patience, kindness, kindness, selflessness. Think of all these things. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So in other words, this is the evidence that we are born again. If you read in John chapter 3, a man called Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, how can I know? And Jesus says, you need to be born again, born of water and born of the spirit. And if you're born of the spirit, this is the evidence is that you will love. It's part of God's nature. And, and when he is in us, that's what comes out. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And here again, we see something that is so unique about our God. You see, we don't love him and receive his love because we love him. No, he made the first move. He loved us while we were still far away from him, when we had nothing to earn his love. And he made a way. He sent Christ to bring us to him. And so he loved us whether we love him or not. And because of his love, we're able to respond to him and love him. That's incredible. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also need to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And so what he's saying here is it's, it's not that God only lives in us if we show love to one another. No, it's when we show love to each other, it's evidence that God is in us. And we're not talking about love as loosely defined as just caring for someone. It's not surface level. It's love as was defined earlier for us. This completely selfless way of considering yourself second and others first. That is a mark of God living in us. And it's so difficult to do this without his help. That's why we know and we see it sustained, this love continuously, that it's evidence of a life that's been changed by Christ. When so much of popular worldview is around self-promotion, about meeting my needs, my desires, then this kind of love goes completely contrary to that. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. And so here John counters the claims of the false teachers that happened a little bit earlier in the book. He says, do they recognize that Jesus is the son of God that was sent to restore God to man? Because that's evidence when we love each other and when we speak by the spirit that Jesus Christ is God, that's evidence of God. And that's a way that we can manage and we can test truth. See, there's popular theory out there that is contrary to the biblical message. It says that if God is love, then he won't send anyone to hell. How can a loving God punish people and let them suffer? The, the consequence of that kind of teaching is that you think that if there is no consequence, if you have a wrong view of what love is, then you can just live however you want to. 
I'm not going to hold, be held accountable. I can determine my own truth. I can define what love is for myself. I can determine right and wrong. And of course, that is a lie. Love has been defined. Truth has been defined. And it's the spirit in us who cries out that Jesus is Lord. You see, if, if God was not going to punish people, if God was not going to hold people accountable, then there was no need to send Jesus to die for us. His suffering would have been pointless. Because Jesus died to restore us to the Father. It's the ultimate sacrifice. It's the ultimate act of love. And if we say there are other ways to God, if we say that he's not going to punish us, if we say there's anything other than Christ that can lead us to him, then we're saying that that sacrifice didn't mean what it truly meant. And so John counters these false claims. He says the evidence is love. And then by the spirit that we can say that Jesus is Lord. We've said this before, God is love and God is also holy. He wouldn't be a loving father if he did not punish and hold evil to account. But of course, when we've accepted his sacrifice, then we don't have to fear condemnation. We live in relationship with him. And he goes on to remind us of this. As we continue reading the chapter, he says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And so John reminds us that when we are in Christ and when Christ is in us, we can look forward to the day of judgment because we know that we do not stand condemned. For a believer, we will stand before the Lord, we will give account for our lives, and we will receive reward for how faithful we have been. But we need not fear being separated from him because what Jesus has done has taken care of all of that. And so being in him casts out that fear of punishment. Because we know that we will spend eternity with God. He wraps up by saying we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must love their brother and sister. And so this, again, just confirms what Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew. We read about that day of judgment. We read about the time when he will separate the sheep from the goats, the believers and the unbelievers. And they will stand there and, and, and some of them will say, but Lord, we did all these things for you. And of course, they name all these miraculous signs and things that they did in Jesus' name. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Because the way that he knows them is by the way they loved their brothers and sisters. Think about what he says there. I knew you when you fed the hungry, when you clothed the naked, when you visited those in prison. That's when I knew when you did this for the least of these, it's as if you did it for me. Mother Teresa famously said, in loving some of the most difficult people that they were to love, she would say, I would see Jesus in a distressing disguise for each person that she was loving, as difficult as it was, she would see Jesus. She would love them. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is what John is saying. This is the mark. This is the evidence of being a believer, is that you would go and love as love has been defined. Others. Simple message. Not so simple to live out. Think about what Jesus said when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And so in a sense, Jesus says all the law and prophets can be summarized 
like this. Not excluded. This is the, the, the highest form. It's the two greatest commands. Because when we make this our priority, loving God, loving others, we naturally live out fulfillment of the law. And so, if anything, if we read these commands, we read what John wrote, we read what Paul wrote, if we think about what Jesus said, we read about love that is selfless and humble and patient. It's this pure way of living. And what we see from all of this when it says that God is love, then we realize that this is what God is like. Patient, pure, kind. Aren't those the kind of words that you want to hear about the creator of the universe? That he loves us so much that he was willing to lay down his life when Jesus died for us. The father sent his son and Jesus gave his life. And so he loved us even when we didn't deserve to be loved. He loved us first. And when we accept his sacrifice, he lives in us and he begins to transform us so that we take on this nature so that we would live out the same love that we have been loved with. He enables us to love in the same way. And this is what he asks us to do. Love me as I have loved you and love others in the same way. Really simple message. Not so simple to live out. And so this morning, before I pray, I want to make it practical for us. It's easy to listen and agree and let it just stay in our heads, this message about love. But we need to actually practically live it out. And so as we pray, I'm going to pause for a moment where we can sit quietly and ask yourself, is there someone, just one person, who I can go and show this kind of love to? this week. I'm giving it as a practical challenge because otherwise it's easy to internalize and not live it out. But take a moment to pause and think. Perhaps it's not someone that it comes not someone that it comes naturally to me to love this person. How can I go and love them? And so as we sit quietly during the prayer, I'm going to ask that God would show us and remind us Love, as we've seen, is a command and a commitment. It's not a feeling that we carry. We don't always feel like loving. But it's something that we choose to do. And it says that we can do it because we've received the love of God. Perhaps you've never experienced that love from God. <laughs> this incredible love as we've read about today. And so if that's you, I'm going to pray for that as well that we would experience this love from God, and that we would then in turn go and love in the same way. Would you join me in bowing your heads this morning? And so, Father, we thank you that as we read about who you are and what you like, we're blown away by this incredible kind of love. We realize that this is who you are. And, Father, I want to pray for each of us this morning, whether it's for the first time, or the hundredth time, it doesn't matter. That we would be overwhelmed by your incredible love. I want to pray for each person that's listening this morning. That as they open their hearts to you, as they ask you to come in, that you would fill them with that love, with that assurance, with that love that casts out fear, with that love that enables them to live selflessly. And as we're aware of your presence, as we're aware of your love, we also want to ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bring to mind any person that we need to go and love this week. And so take, take a moment to wait. So I pray that you would bring people to mind and perhaps a practical way in which we can show them love.
And so, Father, I pray for our community of believers, for, for our church and churches around the world, that as we live together, that as we walk together, we would love like this. And the world would know that we are your disciples. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.